स्वामी अद्वैतानंदा द स्क्रिप्चर्स से टॉर्मेंटेड बाय थ्री काइंड ऑफ सफरिंग फिजिकल एंड मेंटल टेरेस्ट्रियल एंड सुपर नेचुरल पीपल इंक्वायर अबाउट रिलीजन एज एन एंटीडोट टू सफरिंग्स ब्लिस इज इनहेरेंट इन ह्यूमन बीइंग्स देर फोर दे कैन नॉट बियर पेन फॉर इट इज फॉरिन टू देयर ट्रू नेचर हाउएवर Sometimes grief plays an important role in human life it makes people understand the impermanency of the world nothing makes life so empty as the loss of a mother in one's infancy the death of a father in boyhood or the loss of a spouse in old age gopal chandra ghosh of sinthi calcutta lost his wife when he was 55 years of age broken hearted and unable to bear his overwhelming grief gopal went to a friend dr mahendra pal of sinthi for consolation mahendra was a devotee of shri ramakrishna so he suggested that gopal see the master at dakshineswar thinking that holy company might assuage his grief sometime in march or april of 1884 mahendra accompanied gopal on a visit there Mahendra told the master about his friend's condition. Generally Ramakrishna felt an affinity with his disciples at first sight, but he treated Gopal like a stranger. Gopal also did not see anything extraordinary about the master. After returning home, still deeply depressed, Gopal decided not to visit Ramakrishna again. Mahendra told Gopal, "Look, holy people sometimes do not like to be caught easily they test our sincerity through indifference please visit the master frequently the second time gopal went to dakshineswar ramakrishna like a good physician gave him an infallible antidote for his grief speaking of god he lifted gopal's mind uprooting his worldly ties and attachments gopal learned from the master that the world is unreal like water in a mirage and that this passion is the only medicine which will counteract grief and delusion the master's words on the impermanency of the world appealed to gopal and made a lasting impression on his mind he returned home and seriously began to think of renouncing the world to search for god he was attracted to the master and soon returned to dakshineswar Gopal later narrated what happened after his third visit the master possessed me i would think of him day and night the pang of separation from the master gave me chest pain no matter how hard i tried i couldn't forget his face to gopal chandra ghosh was born in 1828 at rajpur zagdadal in 24 parganas nearly 25 miles north of calcutta Very little is known about his family except that his father's name was Govardhan Ghosh. Gopal moved to Sinthi, a northern suburb of Calcutta, in order to work for Beni Madhav Pal. Beni Pal also lived in Sinthi and had a household goods shop at China Bazaar, Calcutta. He was a Brahmo devotee and used to invite Sri Ramakrishna to his beautiful garden house during the spring and fall festivals of the Brahmo Samaj. According to M, the recorder of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, Gopal first met the master sometime in the latter part of the 1870s. M recorded three visits of the master to Beni Pal's garden house in great detail, 28th October 1882. 22nd April 1883 19th October 1884 Gopal probably saw Sri Ramakrishna in the crowd during festival time but this did not leave any deep impression on his mind Moreover Gopal was a self-effacing person and did not try to put himself in the limelight in the company of Sri Ramakrishna as he had no family ties after the death of his wife Gopal moved from Sinthi to Dakshineswar to serve the master. Ramakrishna accepted Gopal as his disciple and would address him as the elder Gopal or overseer. The other disciples called him Gopal da Gopal, the elder brother, since he was 8 years older than Ramakrishna. The master introduced him to holy mother, who needed a person who could shop and run errands for her. 
Ramakrishna praised Gopal's managerial capacity in household affairs and his sweet behavior with people. One way to judge a person's internal nature is to watch his external actions. If he is organized outside, that indicates he is organized inside also. Gopal was neat and clean and by temperament methodical and orderly. A few days after becoming acquainted with the master, Gopal felt intense renunciation and expressed his desire to go for a pilgrimage. On 5th April 1884, M. recorded the following conversation in the Gospel. Master, to the elder Gopal, do you intend to go on a pilgrimage now? Gopal, yes, sir. I should like to wander about a little. Master, to the elder Gopal and the other devotees, as long as a man feels that God is there, he is ignorant. But he attains knowledge when he feels that God is here. A man wanted a smoke. He went to a neighbor's house to light his charcoal. It was the dead of night and the household was asleep. After he had knocked a great deal, someone came down to open the door. At the sight of the man he asked, Hello, what's the matter? The man replied, Can't you guess? You know how fond I am of smoking. I have come here to light my charcoal. The neighbor said, Ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. You are a fine man indeed. You took the trouble to come and do all this knocking at the door. Why? You have a lighted lantern in your hand. All laugh. What a man seeks is very near him. Still he wanders about from place to place. 3. It is not known whether the elder Gopal went on a pilgrimage or not. Perhaps he gradually became close to the master and decided to serve him. In spite of his age, Gopal tried to keep the same pace as the other young disciples. When Narendra would sing to the accompaniment of the Tanpura, a stringed instrument, in the master's room, Gopal would play the tabla, drums. As a newcomer, he was absorbing Sri Ramakrishna's teachings and way of life. One day Dr. Mahendra Pal came to visit Gopal and the master in Dakshineswar. They left his room through the western door and stepped onto the garden path. They saw a woman sweeper coming towards them, carrying on her head a tub of excrement from a privy about five or six yards away. When the master saw her, he prostrated before her, stretching fully on the ground, saying, Mother, who can do this work except you? For in this way the master taught his devotees not to look down upon anybody. Ramakrishna disliked carelessness in people. If a person is forgetful in minor things, he will be forgetful in the vital aspects of life. On 25th May 1884, Sri Ramakrishna went to the Panchavati, where arrangements had been made for Kirtan, devotional singing. Gopal carried an umbrella for the master. Suddenly there was a rainstorm. The master returned to his room with the devotees and the musician continued her songs there. Have you brought the umbrella? The master asked Gopal. No, sir. Gopal replied, I forgot all about it while listening to the music. Gopal rushed to the Panchavati and brought back the umbrella. The master said, I am generally unmindful about the world, but not to that extent. Rakhal also is very careless. Referring to the date of an invitation, he says the 11th instead of the 13th. And Gopal, he belongs in a herd of cows, 5. The word Gopal also means herd of cows. Sometime in 1885 Gopal felt the need for initiation from the master, but because he was bashful he could not ask for it in front of others. Moreover, Ramakrishna did not give any formal initiation to his disciples. He would transmit spiritual power to them in other ways, such as touching .thm or writing a mantram on the tongue, or whispering a mantram in the ear, or singing a song, or just through a glance. Latu described the following incident once, before the noon meal, the master was walking alone in the temple garden of Dakshineswar. 
Gopal Da took the opportunity to express his desire for initiation to the Master. I saw from a distance that Gopal Da knelt down on the ground and, holding the feet of the Master, began to cry. The Master lifted him up from the ground holding his arms. Gopal Da was still crying profusely. What the Master said to him, I did not hear. Since that time I have noticed Gopalda chanting God's name every evening in front of the Krishna temple. 6. In September 1885 Ramakrishna moved to Shampukur in Calcutta for cancer treatment and Gopal accompanied him. He served the master like a nurse, giving him medicine and a proper diet. Usually Holy Mother prepared the master's food and carried it to his room. Gopal acted as Holy Mother's messenger. He was free with her and she did not cover her face with a veil in front of him. When the doctor prescribed any special diet for the master, Gopal would note down the details and convey them to Holy Mother. When the food was ready, she would send Gopal or Latu to inform the master. The devotees and disciples would immediately leave the room and Holy Mother would bring the food. The Master took his meals twice daily, a little before midday and shortly after sunset. Holy Mother would wait in his room until he had finished his meal, then she would take back the cups and plates. On 11th December 1885 Ramakrishna moved to the Kos Sipore Garden House from Shampukur. Gopal continued his usual duties. M. wrote in the Gospel, On the morning of 23rd December Ramakrishna gave unrestrained expression to his love for the devotees. Touching Kalipara's chest, he said, May your inner spirit be awakened. He stroked Kalipara's chin affectionately and said, Whoever has sincerely called on God or performed his daily religious devotions will certainly come here. In the morning two ladies received his special blessings. His love this day really broke all bounds. He wanted to bless Gopal of Sinthi and said to a devotee, Bring Gopal here. In Kossipore, Narendra began to practice intense spiritual disciplines. One night he said to the elder Gopal and Sharat, The master's disease is extremely serious. May he not intend to lay down his body. Strive your best for spiritual enlightenment through service to Him and prayer and meditation while there is yet time. Otherwise, after His passing away, there will be no end to your repentance. 8. On 4th January 1886 Narendra said to the Master, I intend to light a fire under the bull tree of Dakshineswar and meditate. 9. The Master suggested that he practice meditation under the Panchavati because the authorities of the powder magazine, which was adjacent to the Dakshineswar garden, wouldn't allow fire so close. Gopal was in the Master's room. He got permission to accompany Narendra and they left for Dakshineswar at 9 p.m. It was common among the disciples of Ramakrishna to practice japam and meditation the whole night under his guidance. The burning fire of renunciation that the Master instilled in their hearts destroyed all their worldly desires. They forgot their body consciousness, their careers and their family obligations. They loved their Master wholeheartedly and were carried away with divine intoxication by His grace. They served the Master day and night along with their practice of spiritual disciplines. Gopal was responsible for giving medicine to the Master. One day the Master noticed that the time for taking medicine had passed, so he asked another disciple, Where is that old man? When the Master learned that Gopal was sleeping, he said joyfully, Oh, how many sleepless nights he has passed. Let him sleep. Please don't call him. You had better give me the medicine today. Ten Gopal used to wash the master's cancerous sore daily with a special solution made from margosa leaves boiled in water, which is considered to be antiseptic. One day when Gopal touched the sore, the master cried out with pain. Gopal said sadly, Sir, what can I do? 
If I wash, you will get pain, so let me not do it. No, no, you go on washing. Look, I have no more pain, the master replied as he withdrew his mind from that spot. Gopal was then able to wash the area carefully, and the master remained silent and cheerful as if Gopal were washing someone else's wound. Eleven another day at Kos Sipore, Gopal inadvertently breathed on the master's food plate. As a result, the master could not offer the food thus defiled to the Divine Mother, and he never ate any food without offering it first to her. Twelve the master had to be served again with fresh food. After that Gopal was extremely careful while nursing the master. Underscore underscore once Holy Mother recalled a significant incident that took place when the master lay ill at Kosipore. A number of his disciples, including Gopal, were taking turns attending to his needs. But one day, instead of serving the master, Gopal went off somewhere to meditate. He meditated for a long time. When Girish Babu heard about this, he remarked, the one upon whom Gopal is meditating with closed eyes is suffering on a sickbed and fancy, he is meditating upon him. Gopal was sent for. When he arrived, the master asked him to stroke his legs. Then he said to Gopal, Do you think I am asking you to stroke my legs because they are aching? Oh, no. In your previous births, you did many virtuous acts, therefore I am accepting your service. Sri Ramakrishna made his life a model for his disciples to follow. Gopal, though older than the other disciples, tried very hard to follow the ideal the Master set for them. Even his brother disciples praised his sincerity, love, and steadfast dedication to the Master. One day he heard the Master say, Never tell a lie, even jokingly or casually. Fourteen Gopal followed this teaching to the letter and encouraged others to do the same. Once a doctor prescribed the juice of three lemons for the master's upset stomach, and Gopal was interested to collect them. Instead of only three, he brought several additional lemons, but the master accepted only three and asked him to return the extras. Gopal realized that the master was an embodiment of truth, and his speech and action were always congruous. Every year during Makar Sankranti, an auspicious day in the middle of January, monks and pilgrims from all over India go to Gangasagar, the confluence of the Ganges and the Bay of Bengal, for a holy bath. Many pilgrims go by boat from the Jagannath Ghat of Calcutta. Gopal had a little money and wanted to acquire virtue by offering cloths to holy people on that auspicious day. So he bought twelve pieces of cloth and twelve rosaries of Rudraksh beads to distribute among the monks. He dyed the cloths in the ochre color himself. When the master heard about it, he said to Gopal, You will attain a thousand times more virtue if you present those ochre cloths and rosaries to my children rather than giving them to the monks of Jagannath Ghat. Where else will you find such all-renouncing monks? Each of them is equal to a thousand monks. Thirteen this changed Gopal's mind. On Tuesday, 12th January 1886, Makar Sankranti, Gopal gave the ochre cloths and rosaries to the master, who touched them and sanctified them with a mantram. He himself then distributed them among his young disciples. They put on the ochre cloths and saluted the master. Sri Ramakrishna was pleased to see them in monastic doth and blessed them. The disciples who received the ochre cloths were Narendra, Rakhal, Niranjan, Baburam, Shashi, Sharat, Kalijogin, Itu, Tarat, and Gopal. The twelfth cloth and rosary, according to the Master's instruction, were set aside for Girish Ghosh. Later Girish touched them to his head and felt the Master's special blessing. In this sense it may be said that the Ramakrishna order was founded by Sri Ramakrishna himself, although it did not come into official existence until after his death. 
On the evening of 6th May 1886, Narendra and Gopal were meditating in a room. Suddenly Narendra felt as if a lamp had begun to burn behind his head. The light grew more and more intense until it seemed that the lamp itself burst. Narendra went into Nirvikalpa Samadhi. When after a while he became partly aware of his surroundings, he felt that he had somehow lost his body and was nothing but a head. Where is my body? he shouted. Surprised, Gopal came near him. Where is my body? Narendra repeated. Touching him, Gopal said, It is here, Narun. Can't you feel it? But Narendra continued to cry out for his body until Gopal, alarmed, ran to tell the master what had happened. Ramakrishna did not seem at all surprised. Let him stay like that for a while, he said calmly. He's been bothering me long enough to put him into that state. 16. Shri Ramakrishna passed away at 1.02 a.m. on 16th August 1886. At first the disciples could not ascertain whether the Master had died or gone into Samadhi. Immediately Narendra sent Gopal and Latu to Dakshineswar to bring Ramlal, the Master's nephew, thinking that he could determine the Master's condition. When Ramlal arrived, he found that the crown of the Master's head was worn. Several doctors were informed, and at last Dr. Mahendralal Sarkar declared that Ramakrishna had passed away. After the cremation that afternoon, all the disciples left for home except Gopal, Latu and Tarak, for they had no place to go. Within a few weeks the Barnagore Monastery was established with the help of Surendranath Mitra, a well-to-do devotee of the Master. Gopal joined the other disciples, took the final vows of sannyasa, and became Swami Advaitananda, austerity and pilgrimage. Advaitananda lived for a while at the Barnagore Monastery. He helped his brother monks with household work, and played tabla when Vivekananda sang. Sometimes the young monks would tease him or make him the subject of practical jokes. Most of the disciples slept in one large room as they did not have many rooms. One night when Advaitananda went to the bathroom, Akhandananda replaced his pillow with a brick. When Advaitananda returned, he discovered his brick pillow. He smiled and said to Akhandananda, Ganga, the premonastic name of Akhandananda, I know you have done this mischief. Brother, I shall use your precious gift tonight as my pillow. Akhandananda was very touched. Immediately he threw away the brick and brought back the pillow. With an apology, Akhandananda said, Brother, you are a real monk, free from anger and ego. 17. While living at the Barnagore Monastery, Advaitananda visited many holy places in India. He left the monastery towards the end of 1887 and went to Varanasi, where he stayed in a cottage of Banshi Dutta's garden house and lived on alms. He devoted most of his time to spiritual disciplines and made considerable progress. Sometime in the middle of 1888 he went to Kedarnath and Badrinath to holy pilgrimage sites in the remote Himalayas. There he met Akhandananda, whom he had not seen in a long time, and burst into tears of joy. After that he stayed for some time in Vrindavan and practiced austerities. On 25th March 1890 he went to Gaya with Holy Mother, who performed rites for the departed ancestors of her family. In the same year Advaitananda met Vivekananda and six other brother disciples in Merit. The brother monks remained together a few weeks then began to travel again in different directions. Advaitananda left to attend the Kumbha festival at Hardwar with Akhandananda. At last Advaitananda returned to the old cottage of Banshi Dutta's garden house in Varanasi. He decided to spend the remaining part of his life in this abode of Lord Shiva. Swami Virjananda, a disciple of Vivekananda, left this account of Advaitananda. 
in September 18951 stopped at Varanasi on my way to Vrindavan and stayed with Gopalda at Banshi Datta's house. His room was small but neat and clean. He was very methodical and economical. Very early in the morning, even in the cold winter, he would bathe in the Ganges and return to his cottage chanting the Sanskrit hymns on gods and goddesses. He practiced japam and meditation until 9 a.m. and then he would go to beg alms from door to door. He was extremely punctual about his spiritual disciplines, eating, sleeping, walking and other activities. Though his belongings were very few, everything was kept in its proper place. This indicated his great taste and orderliness. In the afternoon during our walk, he would show me the important places of Varanasi. Gopalda, Swami Satchidananda and I circumambulated Panchakoshi, the holy city of Varanasi, in four days and covered 44 miles. We walked until noon and then we cooked, ate and took rest. At night we slept under a tree by the side of the road. 18 Advaitananda passed five years in Varanasi practicing austerities and forgetting the mundane world. He took care of whoever came to Varanasi and would show that person the temples of the city of light. In spite of his old age he was healthy. However, once while walking through the street barefoot, a thorn pricked his foot, giving him a great deal of pain. On 13th August 1896, Swami Shivananda wrote to Pramdadas Mitra of Varanasi. Our old Swami, Advaitananda, who is now at Varanasi, has written that a thorn has pricked his foot and is causing a lot of pain. He has had surgery twice and is still bedridden. Please inquire about him immediately and help him in any way possible. He is now staying at the residence of Sadar Chandrasur, which is behind the Kuch Bihar Kali Temple. Awaiting your early reply, 19 Advaitananda slowly recovered through the loving service of devotees. Advaitananda travelled extensively all over India. In 1897 he visited Raipur, Central India, with Nabai Chaitanya of Konagar. Then he went to Kanyakumari, Rameswaram, and other holy places of South India. In 1899 he visited Kamakya and Darjeeling, and in 1900 he went to Dwarka and other holy places of Western India, at Belur Math. In 1897 Vivekananda returned from the West and established the Ramakrishna Mission. He wanted to do some philanthropic work for the regeneration of India's poor. For that reason he recalled those brother disciples who were practicing austerities in various parts of India. Advaitananda responded to Swamiji's call. He left Varanasi and went to Alambajar, where the monastery had been moved in 1892. In the early part of 1898, a plot of land was purchased at Belur on the bank of the Ganges for the permanent home of the order, and Advaitananda was interested to make the land ready for construction. The site had previously been used as a dock for repairing boats and steamers, and the landscape was uneven. On 13th February, the Ramakrishna Monastery was moved from Alambajar to Nilambar Babu's garden house, just south of the new property. Although he was the oldest of the group, in carrying out responsibilities, he was second to none. Early in the morning after breakfast, he would go to the new plot and engage the Santal tribal labourers who had been hired to level the ground. He scolded them if he found any dereliction of duty. Sometimes Vivekananda would visit the grounds and talk to the poor labourers. He loved to hear the stories of their lives and hardships and sometimes would arrange a feast for them. Once their leader said to Swamiji, O oh dear Swami, don't come to us when we work, our work stops when we talk to you. Later the old father, Advaitananda, scolds us. Swamiji was touched by his words. Then he said, No, no, 
he will not say anything. Tell me something about your part of the country. Twenty thus Swamiji came to know about their culture and way of life. Pioneering work is always difficult. Advaitananda worked until noon, then he took his bath in the Ganges and sitting under a tree he ate his lunch, which had been sent from the monastery. Apart from leveling the ground and other construction work, Advaitananda started a vegetable garden and a dairy farm. Swami Adbhutananda recalled about the early days. Without Gopalda, the monks of Belur Math would not have had vegetables along with their rice. He worked so hard to produce various kinds of vegetables in the monastery garden. 21. In spite of all their hardships, there was fun and laughter among the brother disciples. Swami Vijnanananda related the following incident. Gopalda and Swami Nityananda were together at Belur Math along with several monks and brahmacharins. Nityananda asked the young monks, Brothers, come with me and till this plot of land, I shall grow eggplant and potatoes. The young monks immediately started the project. Gopalda noticed it. He went to them and said, Oh, how hard you are working here! One should not load such a strenuous task on the young ones. You boys, come with me. Gopalda took them to his plot and said to them with affection, Now, brothers, dig this plot for a flower bed. The soil of the other plot is harder than this plot. Swamiji and other monks had a hearty laugh when they heard the story of Gopalda's loving sympathy for the young monks. 22 Once Advaitananda went to visit Holy Mother in Calcutta. Mother was happy to see the old Swami, her devoted attendant. While eating prasad, Advaitananda inquired about Mother's rheumatic pain. She replied, That rheumatic pain is my constant companion. It will not leave me in this life. However, how are you? I also suffer from rheumatic pain, answered Advatananda. But I work hard. I don't get much help from the boys. I am growing various kinds of vegetables, okra, eggplant, plantain, and so on in the monastery garden. As a result, nowadays we seldom buy vegetables. Sometimes I send some vegetables to you. Holy Mother, my son, you are an old-timer, your life is different from the modern boys who generally don't care for household matters. The monastery is like a family home, where you need food, clothing and other necessities. Without these things how can you live there? So it is your duty to take care of the master's children, 23 the young novitiates, who came from modern schools and colleges, could hardly rise to Advaitananda's standard of perfection regarding work, and for that reason they had a very hard time with him. Many of them received mild scoldings from the old Swami, but they took his criticisms more as a token of affection than as any indication of bitterness. One day he had a revelation, which he described later. The Master has shown me that it is he who is manifested through all. Then who is there to blame or whom to criticize? 24. After this experience, Advaitananda ceased finding fault with anyone, however great might be the latter's errors. Turiyananda once said, We are much indebted to Gopalda because we learned the secret of work from him. He was organized and concentrated in everything he did. And he was very methodical in his habits. Until his last day he regularly practiced meditation, 25. Although Vivekananda was 35 years younger than Advaitananda, Advaitananda had tremendous love and respect for Swamiji because the Master had made him the leader of the disciples. On the other hand, Swamiji also had affectionate regard for Advaitananda. Once Swamiji composed a comical verse to tease Advaitananda, but that really indicated in what great esteem the old Swami was held by all. Swamiji had an idea that the monks of the Ramakrishna order should know the Sanskrit scriptures, so he asked Advaitananda to study Laghu Komudi, 
Sanskrit grammar. The Swami took this request as a command and obeyed it with love. Swamiji used to tease this old waggish monk, You are like an old bull breaking off your horns, you have joined the young calves. 26 One day Swamiji said, Gopalda, you are getting old day by day. Be careful. Now you must start taking milk and fruits, which will give you new life and then your bones will not be rusted. After all, you are the oldest among us, so tomorrow we shall wash you ceremoniously with milk. The next day Swamiji and other monks poured ten seers of milk on Advaitananda's head and then washed him with Ganges water. Afterwards a new cloth was offered to him and he was given various kinds of nutritious food. Swamiji joyfully said to him, Brother, from today you are the abbot and the responsibility of the monastery is yours. 27. It was all done in fun. When one of Swamiji's pet ducks suffered for a week and then died from shortness of breath, Advaitananda said to him, Sir, it is no use living in this Kaliyuga, the dark age, when ducks catch cold from rain and damp and frogs sneeze. 28. In 1901 Swamiji made Advaitananda one of the trustees of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission, later he became the Vice President. When Vivekananda died on 4th July 1902, Advaitananda first checked his pulse and then said to Swami Nirbhananda, Alas! What are you looking at? Hurry to Dr. Mahindranath Mazumdar of Barnagore and bring him here as soon as you can. After Vivekananda's passing away, the banner of Sri Ramakrishna was carried by his other disciples. They shaped their lives according to the spiritual ideals of the Master. They also helped others to put these ideals into practice for their physical, mental and spiritual advancement. There is a saying, an organization succeeds not because it is big or because it is long established, but because there are people in it who live it, sleep it, dream it and build a future for it. Advaitananda made strenuous efforts to mold his life according to the example of the Master and would sometimes express disappointment that he fell so short of his ideal. But this feeling of inadequacy indicated his real spiritual height. He had keen powers of observation like Sri Ramakrishna. He forbade the monks to bang doors or tear a new cloth with a shrill noise as the Master could not bear it. He kept himself busy in the service of Sri Ramakrishna and couldn't bear lazy people. Because of his age and temperament, he did not engage in public activities such as relief work and preaching. His monastic life was therefore uneventful. In spite of that, he definitely set an example for all and he was a source of inspiration to many. Even in his old age he would get up early and sit for meditation and japam. He suffered from rheumatic pain, so according to the doctor's instructions, he would do regular exercises in his room. Then he would go to the shrine to bow down to the master. He prayed, Master, I am doing exercise for this body. I have done enough, now release me. 29 afterwards, he would supervise the activities of the monastery. Swami Premananda would do the ritualistic worship in the shrine. When he went to Calcutta for other work, Advaitananda would perform the ritual. In the afternoon he would go for a walk and advise the caretakers of the garden and dairy if they had any problems. At that time the young monks had to do everything in the monastery, Advaitananda helped them by sharing his experience with them. Advaitananda loved to do his own work. If anyone offered any personal service, he would decline. His attitude was that a monk should be self-reliant, depending only on God and no one else. He was fond of music and would play tabla when the brothers sang devotional songs. Sometimes when he had a little leisure, he would copy the scriptures in his beautiful handwriting. He used to chant the Gita every day. For his daily chanting he copied five different Gitas. 
Perhaps he had no money to buy a book. Humor breaks the barrier of age and eradicates monotony, sadness, and gloom from life. For example, a sad countenance was an offense against the rules of the Franciscan order. The brothers were expected to turn a smiling face to God and to humanity. They were to make the Lord glad by their gaiety and not weary him with whining and lamentation. The monks of Sri Ramakrishna also did not care for religion that was obsessed with fear or brought gloom to life. They learned from the Master that humor has its place in religion and the bliss that they experienced was expressed in their lives. Advaitananda had a wonderful sense of humor and loved to tease the brothers. For example, he disliked tea while Swami Subodhananda loved it, so one day he said to Subodhananda, Look, don't drink tea, you will get blood dysentery. But Subodhananda asserted emphatically, Gopalda, each drop of tea produces a drop of blood. All right, brother, drink more, Advaitananda said jokingly. All laughed, towards the end. In late 1909, Advaitananda, an all-renouncing sannyasin of the Master, made himself ready to depart from this world. He had suffered from stomach trouble off and on, and towards the end he had a fever. Dr. Matilal Mukhopadhyay of Gusuri, Havra, was his physician and all the monks served their old brother with loving care. One day the Swami stood in front of Sri Ramakrishna's picture and prayed, Master, please release me from this pain. The Master soon answered the prayer of his old disciple. Swami Premananda later said, Before his death Gopalda saw the Master carrying a make on his shoulder. He then asked, Master, why are you carrying the make on your shoulder? The Master replied, I am Gadadhar, literally, upholder of the make, an epithet of Lord Vishnu. Gadadhar was also Sri Ramakrishna's childhood name. In this age I shall rebuild after destroying everything. 31 Truly, Sri Ramakrishna was born in this modern time to destroy doubt and delusion from the minds of the people. Advaitananda passed away at 4.15 p.m. on Tuesday, 28 December 1909. Until the end he was fully conscious, chanting the name of Sri Ramakrishna. As soon as Premananda put a little Charnamrita, sanctified water, in his mouth, he breathed his last. Premananda wrote a vivid account of his death in a letter, Gopalda has gone to the abode of the Master. He had a little fever and nobody realized that he would leave the body so soon. During his last moments his face looked so beautiful. It is a wonderful play of the Master's devotee. At that time Dr. Matilal Mukhopadhyay was present. Gopalda drank a little lemon juice and milk. He greeted Marty Babu, Dr. Mukhopadhyay, smiling, he left the body, 32 he was then 81. His body was cremated at Belur Math on the bank of the Ganges. Swami Advaitananda started his spiritual journey late, but his sincerity and steadfast devotion to the Master brought fulfillment at the end of his life. Sri Ramakrishna made him a role model for elderly seekers of God. He will be remembered by the Ramakrishna order for his cheerful manner and methodical ways, his self-reliance, his untiring zeal in every work he undertook and his implicit devotion to the Master and his cause.